Okay, so hi, I'm Jolene. Um, I'm the I am a senior web engineer at HumanMade, and I was also the tech lead for the recent Harvard Gazette redesign. And so today, I'm going to talk about uh, how we decided what to build for the Harvard Gazette. Um, and so, I know what you're probably all thinking is Harvard. You know, we had a healthy budget, and we did. Uh, <laughs> Um, but I'm here to tell you that no matter how large your budget is, you're always going to want more. So, um, you know, let's talk about some ways that you can stretch it. And so the first thing that we started to do uh, when we were looking at what features we were going to build is we try to prioritize by use case. And so we have this concept of a hero feature. So this is kind of like your expose. You're going to spend weeks on this. You know, you're interviewing multiple people, doing loads of research. Um, you're going to have uh, a lot of you know, image content, video contents, you're going to build out, you know, a, a, an immersive page, you know, they were really into this idea of scrolly telling, and they wanted to be able to, you know, have different things happen as you scroll down the page and keep users active, like engaged, you know, all the way through reading to the end of the article, you know, this is going to drive thousands of page views a day. Um, you know, but these are the types of articles that you're going to spend, you know, you're, you're spending weeks on this, and you maybe do once a month, once every couple of months. This is like, people will be talking about this, you know? It's a real feature. It's a hero feature. Um, and then you have your everyday articles. So uh, the Harvard Gazette has a daily newsletter. Uh, they put out at least three articles a day for the newsletter, uh, which means that they have to have at least three articles a day that are new on their site. Um, and so, you know, a lot of these are, um, interviewing faculty about their uh, most recent research or, you know, a smaller event on campus, you know, just kind of things that are happening daily that they want to talk about. It could be a promotion within the university. Um, and, and, you know, these are smaller. You put them together in a couple of hours. You know, you, you interview somebody, um, you take some images, you know, some pictures, and you put it together, <laughs> and it, it goes out that day. Um, and so you might have, like, obviously, all articles have a header. Um, you know, that you have some images. You probably have a pull quote. Um, and I included featured articles in this column because they're just used, you know, throughout the site. And we'll talk about those a little bit more later. Um, and then you get your occasional articles. And so these are things that are, like, maybe really big events on campus where you got, you know, a photographer and a videographer. And um, you come, you know, you're coming away with a ton of images and you're creating an image carousel and, you know, you maybe have tabs or accordions and that's kind of where those sorts of things fall in, um, in your use cases. And so um, let's talk about some features. We'll start with an easy one, um, a quote block. Everybody has to have a quote block and you're like, wait, core already has a quote block. It does. Um, it has quote text, it has a citation, and the default WordPress color controls. Um, but we had more requirements. So what were our requirements? We still had to have a quote text, uh, we still had a citation, um, but we had a smaller author image to go next to the citation. Um, we had a larger image that could be placed um, beside or above the, the quote text. And then we wanted to include an audio player, and so it could be um, reading out loud the, the quote text itself, or it could be that the quote is part of like a larger audio recording that was, you know, in the, in the article. Um, and then we also had a call to action button. So, you know, you're learning about something new, you're reading quotes, you know, maybe it's a quote from something else. We wanted to be able to link through to find out more about whatever it is that you're, you're learning about today. Um, and then we had our custom color palette picker, and this is not the core one. Um, so let's take a second to talk about that. Um, so for our articles, we wanted to be able to set um, color palettes for the whole article based on six predefined color palettes. And so um, we wanted to be able to ensure consistency across the site, the site but still leave it open to um, the content editors to be able to set the mood, you know? Like you're not wanting using something bright and cheerful on an obituary, you know? We have a nice like, somber gray for that um and but then we have you know we have red and green and blue and purple and yellow and um you know we wanted to be able to set the colors for all of the kind of little small ui elements and background um 
colors and things like that throughout the whole, uh, the whole article at the same time. Um, but then also override that on a per block basis. And so a lot of the custom blocks that we built had to include this color picker. Um, the nice thing about it, it makes accessibility approachable. So, you know, a lot of the people who are entering content daily, like they understand accessibility is important, but they don't really know how to make it accessible. Um, and in their heads, it's like this big thing, it's scary. And so we were trying to make it less scary. And so we wanted to be able to like, set the background color and the text color and the UI elements all at the same time to you know, a palette that has already been checked for you know, color contrast requirements. Um, and so this, the, you know, this was like a big deal. This was part of why a lot of them were custom, although you obviously can register new things for existing blocks. Um, a lot of our articles also, or blocks also had other reasons why they were custom. So let's talk about some of that um, in a minute. <laughs> First, let's talk more about quotes. Uh, so we realized we had some, when I, oh, okay. How do we start out with our quote block? Um, so we built a custom wrapper block. It's kind of like a group block, um, but making it custom allows you to add block styles and you know your own options. Um, you you know you can register your your sidebar options and um, you can define a um, an inner block pattern. And um, but it's still basically you know it's a group block, but you get to customize it. Um, and so this was really quick to set up. You know, we did an inner, inner blocks pattern. We used our quote block, you know, the core quote block, the core buttons block, the core image block, um, the core audio player. And, you know, we got it all set up and we're like, great, it's done, right? Yeah, it's done. Um, no, <laughs> we had some problems. So uh, we had too many blocks in this little small space and they all have their own options. And then, that means they all have their own alignment options. And so I have an image here where it's flipping between what, what it's supposed to look like and what was getting created. Um, because it's really easy if you're clicked on the wrong block and you use the alignment option to get one piece on the left and one piece centered and one piece on the right. And it's not what we were going for. Um, and so we just got this feedback. This is too confusing. <laughs> we need a better user interface. Um, and so what do we do? Uh, so we we took some of the things that were easiest to do uh, out of the inner blocks and moved them into the wrapper block. And so we we added um, image uploaders for our images. We added um, rich text controls for the quote text and the citation text so that they're not inner blocks anymore. <laughs> you know, and so um, as inner blocks, we only left uh, buttons and the audio player because we didn't want to reinvent the wheel on those. Those are some really complex blocks and there's no need to rebuild them. They do what they're supposed to. <laughs> but we registered some different variations so that um, from the inserter, you could choose what you were looking for. You know, I just want a quote and a button, or I just want a quote and an audio player, or I want the whole thing, you know? And so we had these variations and that allowed us to kind of preset what would be available once you inserted it. You know, it, you would have the right inner blocks, you would have the right custom fields. And so what did we learn? You know, these are some things we probably already know, but it, you know, you need a little reminding sometimes. Uh, so a poor user in experience requires an increased training budget. If they can't use it and you have to spend all your time training them on how to use it, you're going to hire someone new and they're not going to know how to use it. And it's, a it's an ongoing problem. And so sometimes, you know, just a little bit more time in the beginning saves you time in the long run. Um, and so it didn't actually, even though we had already finished it, it didn't take that much longer for us to make the changes that we made. And if we had done that to begin with, we would have saved that time. Um, and so sometimes, you know, sometimes custom isn't actually more expensive. Um, and so let's talk about the next one. The next feature is article headers and templates. And so we had six different layout styles for the article headers. Uh, again, we needed the color palette picker. Uh, we wanted the, the body content to, to change layout depending on what the layout of the header was so that the title and the text content would always be aligned. And, um, 
anywhere that there's an image, you should also be able to, up, you should be able to upload an image or a video or do a YouTube or Vimeo embed. So, you know, <laughs> no core image block. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, for some of the layouts, we wanted to be able to align the media on the left or the right. Uh, we found out that their bylines are not actually WordPress authors. And so, um, you know, the the editorial team would be entering articles and they, you know, they choose who to credit it to, to and they type that in. Um, and then we also had some kind of like miscellaneous things, like nice to have type options. Um, so like you can choose to fade in the title text on page load. Um, and so we had some options. How do we build this thing? One of our options was we could make multiple post templates. And um, that was the first thing we thought of because we're like, all right, so we've got page templates, we've got core blocks, we can set this all up. It's easy to switch between them in the editor. You can choose which page template you wanna use for your, uh, for your article. The downside to that is that you can't see the changes when you make them. You know, you have to save the page and then go preview it in the other tab and then go back and make more changes. Not a very nice workflow, but you know, if if you're like strapped for budget and you're willing to, you know, to, to make some compromises, it's totally doable. It would have been a little bit faster. Um, but so that was one of our options. Uh, the next option we thought of is we could make multiple article header blocks because these are all so different. They require a different layout so that we're getting our accessibility requirements because you want your tab order to be correct. And everything's changing, everything's moving from, uh, from style to style. Um, and one of the problems though with doing the multiple article headers was that um, if you wanted to change, you'd have to add a new one, copy all your stuff over and delete the old one. Um, and it's just not, you know, <laughs> it's not a great experience. Um, you know, maybe we could have ported it, you know, like set it up so that it would take the things, but we were just worried that what if stuff doesn't transfer over? And um, we also wanted to really kind of strictly define what was available at the top level. Um, because of the layout shifting, um, we wanted to be able to do that automatically. So if you, um, if you change the article header, we wanted to also have it automatically change where the text was. So the editors didn't have to worry about that. Um, so that like if the, if the article header um, headline was on the, on the left, you wanted the con body content to also be on the left and not have to like make those settings um, changes yourself. Um, and so, yeah, our next option was to do a custom article header block with multiple block styles. And it's really custom. What do we choose? We did the custom article header. <laughs> and uh, why? So I kind of want to talk about that. Uh, we realized as we were talking to Harvard about it, we're like, all right, so do you really need six different layouts? And do you really need all these other extra options? And, you know, <laughs> Like, do we, you know, do we need to be able to fade the the title text in on page load? You know, can we not just use WordPress users for our authors so that everything is like a core functionality? And um, basically they said, yes, we need all of that. Um, based on their traffic, like the vast, vast majority of their users hit an article first. No one ever goes to the homepage first. And so this is their first experience of the site. And so what we realized was that this is actually, even though it's an everyday feature, it's on every single article, it's also a hero. You know, it is the thing that people are gonna see, you know, when they first come to the site. And we wanted every article to have the opportunity to be different and be special and tell that story right from the beginning to, um, you know, to just like really be able to, to, to customize it. Cause you know, you have, um, you have some images that, can't be cropped. They have rules, you know, you can't, you're not allowed to crop this image or you have, um, you know, you have users in it or users, <laughs> people, <laughs> you have people in the image. <laughs> and so, you know, cropping with people gets really tricky because you don't want to take anyone's face off. <laughs> you know? um, and not all of the article header styles will work for all of the image, um, all the, all the images. Yeah. And so, 
Uh, the next thing that we just that we discovered was just really, really important to them was just that visual editing experience. And so they wanted to be able to kind of like tell the the story, like go on that journey as they're putting the article together and um, you know, choose their favorite image from the ones that they have to work with and start typing in their title and start typing in their subhead and get some um, some body copy going. And then start thinking about, well, based on the mood of the article I'm trying to set or, you know, the the aspect ratio of this image that I've chosen, you know, which article header best fits this, you know, this article that I'm putting together. And just to be able to see that just immediately when you make that change, to be able to see it change and to, to get that feeling of, you know, uh, what is it that I'm putting together? Just make, make it super simple easy to use, you know, you've got your fields, you can put stuff in those fields, but you can't move things around, you know, there's not, there's not room to mess this up, you know, and so that was just really, really important to them, they wanted to be simple, and they wanted to be able to switch between the styles, see it right away, not lose content, and so, you know, that, to do that, it had to be custom, and so, um, so that's what we did, um, and then, you know, the next thing is featured articles, and, uh, you know, now that we've built all those articles, what are we going to do with them, right? Um, so this is an everyday feature. Um, it promotes organic browsing across the sites. You know, we wanted to be able to keep people on the site, drive traffic to new and interesting and other things. Um, it's used on the homepage. It's used in the footer and the main navigation. And they use them. And most of the articles have it as supporting content also. Um, and so what did we build? To this chase, I built a custom blog for this one too. <laughs> um, but why not use the core query loop block? And I can tell you originally, we thought we were going to, we wanted to, we're excited about it. Core query loop is locked, it's great. You know, you've got a customizable post template, you can choose what you want to put in there, you can put custom blocks in there. Um, you've got all kinds of filters for selecting what you want to show and what order you want to show it in. Um, and, you know, there are some downsides like, Currently, if you want to do live reloading for like an archive page or something like that, if you have custom blocks in it, that doesn't work. You have to do the, the actual pagination where it loads a new page. I hear it's coming. The live reloading for custom blocks is coming. I don't know when. Um, <laughs> and we've run into this on other projects, but, you know, it wasn't really like a huge factor for this because we, for the most part, we're using this featured article blocks in places where you're just featuring, you know, you're putting like three or four blocks, right? Or articles. So you, pagination's not a thing. Um, but let's talk through what our requirements were. So we had 13 unique block styles. Um, you know, some of them, you might have a really big image on top with your article content below, or we had an image with um, a stacked uh, content area sort of overlapping it. You know, we had some lists where you have a list of article titles and only the first one has an image, or, you know, a list of article titles and dates, and you've got little images for each one. You know, so I like all your different kind of patterns for what you might want in your featured images. Um, in some places you're showing dates and categories and other places you're not. Um, and so, you know, we could have used, for those requirements, we could have used the, po the post templates, um, but for the article or for the, um, for the content editors to set that up within articles, um, it would just be a lot to choose from. To kind of think about what do I want to turn on here? You know, which, which toggles do I have to switch and, and how, do I, how do I choose the right post template? And how do I make sure it looks like it's supposed to? And um, we wanted to be able to dynamically set those options based on a block style that you could just choose the block style and it sets it up with the fields that you need. Um, but the thing that really made it have to be custom is <laughs> Harvard didn't want to just have an automatic list of recent posts. You know, sometimes, yes, but they also wanted to be able to like say, for this, for this article, I don't want to just go by category. You know, I think that these specific posts that we've written before are directly relevant to what you're reading right now. And so I want to choose these ones. Um, and so uh, luckily, Human Made has a handy dandy HM Gutenberg tools that includes a post selection. So, you know, I can link to that later if y'all are interested. But 
um, it's really useful. It, it creates an interface where you can uh, select which articles you want and what order you want them to show up in. Um, so we already have that to use. So that was an easy choice. You know, it's not like we're reinventing the wheel to figure this out. Um, but then the next requirement that if that one hadn't already needs to be custom, this one definitely would. So Harvard wanted to be able to edit the post title and featured image on a per block instance for each of the articles. <laughs> <laughs> so lots of reasons why you might want to do this. Um, we went back and forth a little bit on whether it was really necessary, but apparently it really, really, really is necessary. Uh, because sometimes, you know, you want to have your SEO title or you want to have your super descriptive title or you want to have like a catchy, buzzy title to get people interested, you know, and depending on where it's being used, if it's really small, you just want a short title. And so, <laughs> you know, depending on which layout we're using, you know, maybe you want to use a different image because the one that works for the featured image on the article doesn't look good when it's cropped in this teeny tiny square. So we want a different image. So, okay, <laughs> let's build a custom featured articles block. And uh, yeah, so I um, just want to recap a couple of things we talked about. I'm pretty, I have no idea what time it is, but I'm pretty, <laughs> pretty sure we're going to have lots of time for the questions. I set that up intentionally. So some takeaways, everyone has a budget. Um, some of the best ways to figure out what's most important to you is to prioritize by your use case. Think about like, how is this going to be used? How often? Who is it for? You know, is this the thing that without this, your site doesn't exist? Is this the thing that like you've got budget and you have decided it's the big feature that you have to have? It's really exciting and new and you want to tell everybody about it. Um, you can do a lot with core features, but... <laughs> Uh, poor, inter poor user inter experience can increase your training budget, and sometimes custom is less expensive. So you just have to choose what's worth investing in. And so I want to say thank you and open for questions. It can be about the things we talked about here. Um, it could be about anything that you've seen on the Harvard site that you're excited about and have questions about. I'll do my best. Um, I'm, I'm happy to talk about it, though. So, yeah. Um, so the question, sorry, I forgot to... Pete, the last one, um, the last one was whether we deregistered um, core blocks. And so far, the answer is mostly no. Um, the next question is governance. Governance, so who decides that we need to have 13 different block styles? And, um, you know, that <laughs> it was a bit of a slow process, you know, as things do. You start out with a couple, and then you realize that these other things that we've designed are actually featured articles, too. <laughs> And, um, you know, we, we just had a lot of different use cases. So basically the entire homepage is featured article blocks and it's just different layouts. And so, you know, they wanted to be able to, to show things in different ways and have, you know, have carousels and have, um, like a single article that's really flashy and have, you know, your lists on, you know, in smaller spaces like the sidebar and stuff to be able to say like, you know, these three articles are related. And um, I, I'm not best positioned to crack down on governance, you know? I think that, you know, this came directly from like the editorial team. They, they felt like they needed that. So, yeah. I, I, as a developer, if they're paying me and prioritizing it, yes, that's my job to build it. Um, but I totally understand that, you know, um, that's not it for everybody. <laughs> we did, yeah, we have, um, so one example, we have a, a series taxonomy. And so Harvard was really keen on writing these, um, these articles that would all be part of a series. And they wanted to have um, like really cool taxonomy archives where they could show them off. And so we did do a lot of work on um, things like each series can have its own logo. And if it doesn't have a logo, it falls back to a little icon. And then, you know, so we have like little custom blocks and they're just little tiny ones. They didn't take long to make, but they're just little, you know, little custom things to grab the, um, the icons or the, you know, the logos from the, um, the taxonomy item. So we, we added a, um, an image uploader to the taxonomy edit screen so that for each taxonomy item, you can have a custom logo. 
and then we have the block that pulls that to put it on the on the article itself and then the the archive pages also have that logo and you know there's some some editable text like describing we had to add a um, a rich text field to describe the um we had to convert the regular description field into a rich text field so that you could link stuff inside of it um and, and yeah on, on the on the on the archive pages we have um different layouts so the top part has like six articles and then below that um and those are in a grid and below that they're you know like one after another in a in a list style view and, and yeah lots of custom stuff with taxonomies too i think you had something yeah yeah so that's how they already had it set up um and we suggested we could um we could in our migration we could go through all the articles and add wordpress users for all, all of the um all of the authors that are here so that they'll be wordpress users and they don't ever have to log in you can just select them um but no uh <laughs> they didn't want to have that many users <laughs> Um, they didn't want to have users that weren't logging in, you know, they want to have to manage that like database of users, um, but they also wanted to be able to. Um, so yeah, some of the downsides is that every, um, it, I guess, it depends on how you look at it, a downside or upside. So every article has, you know, um, basically meta for the author and the only way to change that is to go and update the article. Right. And so if somebody, you know, gets a new title or gets married, divorced, changes their name for whatever reason, you know, you'd have to go back if you wanted to, if you wanted to update it, you'd have to go back and change all the posts that were attributed to them individually or figure out some script to run. Um, but Harvard made the decision that for historical purposes, they didn't want to go back and change old articles. So they, they wanted it to be reflective of what that person's position was at that time. And so they decided that that was just what made the most sense to them um, for like their specific use case. Now we just don't have author archives. They didn't want them. Um, so I've been, I've been forgetting to repeat the questions, but let me repeat this one. So it's, um, she asked, uh, how long has it been live and how, um, what percentage of these features that we built are being used? And uh, we launched in January, if I've got the date right. And so, you know, about the uh, six-ish months. And um, I think they're using most of them. I, you know, I was, um, there's a couple of the <laughs> ones we didn't talk about that are really, <laughs> really, really custom. Um, uh, so like we have, um, we have this, um, we call it the immersive block. <laughs> So you can set a custom background. It could be an image. It could be a video. Um, you can have text on top. You can basically have any block on top. And um, as you as you scroll, it'll you know it'll like scroll through above the background and it'll stick. And then you scroll some more. And um, I think they're starting to really use that now. And so they've got some just like really amazing examples of using it. Um, I can try to dig some up later. But you know when I when I first started working on um blog posts and talks and things um for their site they hadn't used it yet so i was like oh man i really want to talk about this yet but i can't find an example um but yeah i think that at this point they're using all the stuff that we built for them there's still a little bit of confusion like i said about like which quote block do i use and a lot of them are still using the core quote block so i should have probably deregistered that from the beginning um so that's <laughs> Just to touch on that again, if you are going to take blocks away, do it before they know they exist. <laughs> yeah, um, I don't have exact numbers. Um, I think that they're, you know, they have um, like three or four people on their, um, on the, that were on the, the primary team that we worked with that are more of the, like the technologists. And then I think they also have like three or four um, people on the editorial team that are working on it daily, but I'm not sure how many people they have beyond that. Yeah, that's a good question. So um, 
the discovery process and, um, and the, <laughs> could we have headed off some of the things. Um, so we actually had a really amazing discovery process. We had, um, we were, we partnered with Furthermore. Um, they're a great design agency in the UK. And we had a week long on site at, um, at Harvard um, where human made and furthermore were there and everyone involved in the website was there. Um, even though they all work remote too, not all, most of them, some of them. <laughs> so everybody came to Boston and, um, you know, we did a lot of like discovery in person where we talked about, um, the different types of user personas and like their journey through the site and what different types of people would be interested in. So, you know, what are, you know, what are faculty interested in? What are alumni interested in? What are students interested in? And what can we do more in each of these areas to appeal to different types of users? And, um, you know, and we kind of did like brainstorming sessions where we thought of like, what are some cool features we can do? made a big, big list of those and then cut out all the things that <laughs> we didn't think they'd actually use very often. Um, but, but yeah, that, that was really great. And then, you know, as things go, um, there was a design period, you know, where, um, the, the design team is interacting with the internal team and, you know, we're kind of just keeping an eye on, is it possible to build this? Um, but yeah, at that stage, it probably could have been where we would have said, wait, all of these look like featured articles. Do we really need all of these different styles? But, you know, I think when it, when it comes down to it, it's like I talked about with the, um, the article headers, you just have to decide, you have to decide what you're going to invest in. And for them, featured articles were really, really important and they wanted all those different styles. So they said, you know, if we, if we do this and that means we can't do this other cool thing that we don't think they're going to use, <laughs> Like, why don't we just wait on this other cool thing and maybe we'll build it in a year if they still want it. Um, yeah. Yeah, you just, yeah, yeah, kind of got to like boil down, like what's important here, you know? And we had a few things that we had to cut that we didn't get to because we we spent so much time on the featured articles and, and the article header and things like that that ultimately were just what they cared more about. Yeah, so um, all told, it was about a year. So I think we had um, approximately six months of design and six months of development. I, you know, I don't know exact, but more or less, yeah. Yeah, the header block is always at the top. And so actually, um, uh, we we registered a post uh, a um, post template for the blocks, um, and so for the articles, they, um, the top level is locked. So it always has an article header and it always is followed by a group block. Um, and so that way they can't put anything outside of that. Um, and, and, and that was to, to, to make sure that everything was always in alignments to make sure that we didn't end up with like weird stuff happening, extra header blocks or header blocks in the wrong place or, you know, um, any of that, but we also had some, um, if we don't have any other questions, um, I can expand on that a little bit more. We also had, um, uh, we had, instead of a regular sidebar, um, we wanted to have uh, supporting content. So we wanted pieces of content to be able to sit in what would normally be the sidebar space, but be directly related to whatever they sat next to, to not be all stacked at the top. So it, they could be staggered down the page. Um, and on mobile, we wanted those to insert themselves in line. So if it's like right next to a paragraph, it would go right before that paragraph on mobile instead of the whole thing dropping down below on mobile. And so um, we actually, we had to build another, you know, custom block for that. Um, it's another one of those um, custom group blocks where you can put anything at all that you want inside of it. Um, but having it be custom allowed us to do, you know, cool stuff with it. Like, the, the group block, depending on where it sits, already has the ability to, um, to be sticky. And so that was another requirement for this thing was like, we wanted to be able to be sticky. So like maybe you have a Q and A and so you've got like a question on the side and the answer next to it. And we wanted the question to follow if you're, if you're moving down the page until you got to the next question and then stop following. And so, um, so we used that space for that, you know, to do that, um, that supporting content. And we wanted to make sure that 
that was always going to be inside of that group block because otherwise it wouldn't work. <laughs> so yeah, we locked the we we locked the outer template and then we unlocked inside of the group template. And I don't know if you all have worked with locking templates, but it doesn't work the way you think it does. Um, <laughs> and also, you can tell it that you're allowed to change the inner template or the inside. Like it, you can tell it that the inside is unlocked, and it will be unlocked, but it will fail validation constantly. So we actually had to turn off validation. We, we you know, we just <laughs> we decided that what we cared about was having the top level locked, and then we didn't care what they put inside the group block. And there was there not a, it was not possible to add stuff inside the article header block. So that worked for us. We didn't we didn't need to do template validation for that type of post because we'd already locked it down to what we wanted them to be allowed to do. Do you have? Oh, oh yeah yeah okay um, yeah it is a, it's a human made plugin thank you um, so um, H M Gutenberg tools. Um, and it has like a bunch of just like random things that we've built that we've found makes it easier for us to build the things our clients want on every project. And so, you know, we just like checked it into its own little repo. Um, and I can look that up and share the link. Um, pretty sure it's public. Um, but yeah, it's, it's great. And that's, that's where we got the, the, the post selector. Yes. So we didn't do a lot of user-based documentation. Um, we um, we did you know we did training sessions um, and we record everything. So we we make recordings available. Um, we have some we you know we we did do some. I heard somebody mention maybe yesterday's architectural decision records. We did some of those. They're not really for the users. Um, but, uh, and I think we did some user documentation in maybe Confluence. We, we were willing, we, we put it wherever people want it to be. Um, but mostly we were focused on making it so you didn't need the documentation because it just worked the way you would intuitively expect it to work. So that's like a lot of where the custom work came in was just making the editor so easy to use that, you know, they didn't, they didn't have to go look it up because what we find with documentation is people forget where it lives. You know, they, it's not that they don't read it. They just don't even know it exists. So, um, you know, we're always happy to do documentation, but, you know, we just, we just, we try to make it make sense, you know, be something that will be valuable. Yeah. So we have a question. Um, can we talk about how we manage the migration process to blocks from classic editor content? Yeah, so we had, um, we used, um, you know, we, um, HumanMade also has a, a migration package that helps with migrations. Um, but then, you know, as we migrate the content in, we used convert to blocks, which is great. It, you know, you have it has to recognize the type of content. So we did have to do some um, some custom scripts in our our migration script to say like for this old type of content that was using this random like plugin or widget or 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 whatever before. You know, we would like this old piece of content to be converted into this new type of content. And so, you know, we had to like kind of script it to get the bits and then write, you know, the right HTML to, to output that as a block. Um, let's see the next one with so many blocks that can be used. Any concern with consistency for user? If staff are using different styles depending on their preference or are certain blocks designated for certain content? So, um, we kind of went with the idea that everything should fall within the same general style. So everything should fit the style guide, even if it's a different color or a different layout. So, you know, there are some things like you wouldn't want to put like some of the bigger flashier single featured article, um, layouts in the sidebar. Cause it wouldn't fit. It would just look weird, you know? Um, but if you did, it would basically default to the mobile view because we did use some, um, uh, the name is just escaping me now, but instead of media queries, we did container queries. Yeah, for some of them so that even when they got tiny, they would look good. Um, and as far as like using them in different places and for different preferences, um, 
Mostly the only people editing the site are the um, the editorial staff. So they have their own, I think they communicate with each other and they know what they want to use in different places. So they're kind of setting that governance themselves a bit. So partly we we didn't have some of the same challenges that that you all have on your your multi sites where you've got you know a different kind of user base for every single site. You know we had like a specific team that we were building for, so that that made that bit a little bit easier. Um, and can you talk about why you chose to use custom blocks versus patterns? Yeah, so we did use some patterns in some places. Um, I like to think about patterns though as like a group of blocks, um, and so. You know, it might be something that you want to use. You've, you've built this cool section and this section has some headers and some text and, you know, maybe your, your you know, your mail sign up form and, you know, an image. Like it has like a group of things that all live together that you want to use in lots of places throughout the site. And so that is the perfect use, use case for patterns. Um, you know, you can have it synced and then they'll all be the same. So if it's like always the same mail form, it's the same everywhere. You update it once, it updates everywhere. Or it could be like, hey, this is a, this is a good starting place. We know we're going to always want these elements working together for this kind of section, um, but we're going to change it every time. So that's your unsynced pattern. Those are great. We use lots of those too. Um, but for some of the custom things that we built, it was um, it was because we had features and 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 options that couldn't be set with core blocks. So even if we had a group block on the outside, we just couldn't we couldn't make that experience be what we wanted it to be. And then, as developers, if it's hard for us to make it exactly what we want it to be, it's going to be really hard for you know. Um, your average user to figure out like, how do I want to put these pieces together? And what if I want to move this? And, you know, and then you just, you end up with sort of a broken looking block and they get really frustrated. And we just wanted to kind of avoid some of those frustrations by, you know, making it simple. You know, you click the alignment button and the image and the text switch. You don't have to like drag it around and change the columns and then figure out, well, why is this one, you know, why is there all this space here? How do I get rid of this space? You know, we just had it do it automatically. 